No. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, members of the uh, Pentagon Press Corps, for your continued efforts to inform the public about the ongoing situation and the danger posed by Hurricane Michael. Given the high winds, storm surge, and flash flooding, Hurricane Michael is now bringing it to the Florida area. I echo FEMA Administrator Brock Long's comments about how crucial it is for the residents and the visitors in the area to listen to and follow the instructions of the local, state, and tribal officials. I also want to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to the first responders at local, state, and federal levels. The region affected by Michael has tremendous capability that has been on display since well before Michael made landfall and continues right now as Michael does make landfall. And last time we were here, nearly a month ago, I explained how, in accordance with the National Response Framework, along with FEMA, state, governors, National Guard, DOD was responding to Hurricane Florence. U.S. Northern Command task forces were anticipating requirements surrounding the storm and proactively positioning forces to respond immediately across the full spectrum of DOD capabilities at every level, by air, in coastal and flooded areas, and on the ground. And while every storm is different, and Michael presents challenges that were quite different than Florence, we are once again surrounding the storm with military capability that we can surge forward in support of FEMA, state, and local officials. And at the local level, the Secretary of Defense is given authority for life-saving and life-sustaining actions to make DOD capabilities immediately available to our federal partners. The region is being affected by Michael as 10 major military bases and installations and is home to more than 700,000 military members and their families. Our military bases and installations are part of the communities and local commanders are coordinating with and postured to assist their fellow community members. And at the state level, National Guard units under the authority of their governors are tremendously capable, ready and responding to their state's requirements. Under the National Response Framework, working through FEMA and other emergency coordination networks, DOD is ensuring that we understand the governor's priorities and requirements in ways that we can contribute to the overall effort. Additionally, in close coordination with the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Joe Engel, we are ensuring that our efforts are seamless and that the Department of Defense is optimally positioned to respond to any immediate requests for assistance. And Homeland Defense is the number one priority for NORTHCOM and NORAD. At the same time we are posturing Title X forces to support the FEMA-led federal response to Hurricane Michael, we are also posturing Homeland Defense assets and equipment to ensure we maintain our ability to defend the homeland. And literally, as we speak right now, Hurricane Michael just went over Tyndall Air Force Base, which was one of our key command and control nodes for a home and defense mission. And we were able to pre re reposition our capable, capable ability to maintain the command and control at other locations, so we seamlessly kept our ability to maintain the defense of our homeland. And as I mentioned, we are surrounding the storm. This is no small feat, given the unprecedented size and strength of Michael. The storm is making landfall as a category four, category 4 storm in Florida, but it's also important to know as it tracks to hit Georgia, it will still be a Category 2 storm. And then it will continue north through the Carolinas, and they're still recovering from Florence. In one area we're focusing on is early response search and rescue, or, or SAR capabilities. We have proactively prepositioned appropriate military capability and capacity to respond immediately from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west, across the full spectrum of DOD capabilities at every level by air and coastal and flooded areas and on the ground. So let me give you some details. From the south, we repositioned at Patrick Air Force Base, Florida, two pararescue teams supported by air refueling capability with the ability to respond to any immediate requests anywhere in the affected areas. From the east, we have 35 rotary wing aircraft and 80 high water vehicles at Fort Stewart and Hunter Army Airfield that are able to respond in the air or on the ground to any immediate request for search and rescue assistance. And from the north, at FEMA's request, we have positioned commercial power vehicles and teams at the Marine Corps Logistics Base in Albany, and we've added critical supplies, commodities, and high water vehicles at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, North Oxfield, South Carolina, and Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The same incident staging bases that are part of the ongoing Hurricane Florence recovery efforts. And then from the west, we're positioning additional pararescue teams supported by air refueling capability and swift water rescue boats to provide immediate life-saving support for Hurricane Michael. 
And this is indeed a collaborative effort, and we're integrated with the U.S. Coast Guard as the lead federal agency for SAR. The Coast Guard is directed by the Department of Homeland Security for disaster response, and while we are different departments, let, let there be no doubt that we are fully integrated together. And let me give you a couple other examples of our DOD support. Our Army Corps of Engineers has 80 personnel deployed to the affected area already. They've also prepositioned 55 generators with an additional 30 generators on the way. Our Defense Logistics Agency has prepositioned fuel supplies at Maxwell Air Force Base and other areas, along with 145 additional generators. And we also maintain C-17s on alert on a three-hour string that can respond to any requirements. And finally, we have aeromedical evacuation teams on standby, ready to respond if we need to evacuate anyone out of the area. And as you can see, we have these early response forces prepositioned to rescue citizens in need as soon as possible after the storm's passage, from helicopters to high water vehicles to swift water boats and pararescue teams were postured to fac facilitate timely and effective military responses as soon as possible after receipt of FEMA mission assignments. Now I'd like to take any questions you have about our preparation. Bob. General Bob Burns with AP. Um, you mentioned Tyndall. Uh, and you said that the Homeland Defense Command node, if that my word there, has been moved. Air, Air Operations Center. Okay, right. Air Operations Center. Has, can you say where it's been moved? And also can you say uh, at both Tyndall and Eglin and Hurlburt, have you essentially evacuated those those areas or they, or they still have they still operate. Sure. Let me start with the uh, Air Operation uh, Center's capability and capacity. Uh, we look at, across the, uh, the, the continental U.S. and we have other nodes and other places where we can actually do the same command and control mission set and seamlessly transition in. Based on the classification, I'm not going to tell you the specific base that it transferred to, but we actually did that last night. And so before the storm ever arrived, we'd actually transferred that command and control capability to another facility. Uh, with respect to the, each of the individual bases, uh, each individual installation commander has given different directions uh, to their bases, and depending on exactly where they were, for example, Tyndall right in the path of the storm had most of the, uh, the both the personnel and families evacuated with others had less uh, evacuated. But that is out to the local installation commanders in coordination with the local officials, for example, the governor. So what did they do at Eglin then at Robert? What, what's happened there? Again, specifically, I won't go into the specific details of, of what's happened at each base, but we'll say that uh, each of them maintains their ability uh, to uh, maintain for our vantage point the mission set and if we are no longer to do the mission set from there then we transition the mission to somewhere else and so whilst the the aircraft may go for example and and, and her back out we will have other aircraft in a different location that will pick up that role so you can't talk specifically about Eglin why, why can't you talk about that uh, it's not within my purview uh, as a home and defense and as this particular hurricane effort we concentrate on the preparation for us to be able to respond to the uh, local citizens to respond to that. The installation commanders very specifically have the authority to make the decision of what they're going to do within their command. Tara? Just tell us what happened. Yeah. Tara Kopp. Hi, sir. Uh, Tara Kopp with Military Times. Um, I noticed you didn't mention any ships. Is that a lesson learned from last time, or are there just no ships that were, you know, nearby to respond? No, thanks for asking that, because in fact, uh, for the Florence, the, the ships were a, a, a particularly important part of our ability to surround the storm, if you will, with the, both the Kursage and the Arlington being a key part of that, uh, that plan. In this particular case, just because of geography, in fact, I use the Patrick Air Force Base uh, forces, uh, that because of the way the geography is, is, uh, is laid out, we are actually coming from the south, even though uh, they're not necessarily having to come from the sea, per se. So it really isn't a question about whether we needed ships or didn't need ships. As much as it was, we have the ability to surround the storm to get that capability in from all 360 degrees without necessarily having to use ships to do that. And do you have any estimate of how many military personnel from those 10 bases did end up evacuating or getting out of the way of the storm? Uh, no, I can't. I can't give the number over the total. Now, mind you, of those installations, many are actually not directly in the path uh, of that and be part of the response effort, while some, like Tyndall, again, right in the middle of the path of the storm. And then do you have any assets that are still tied up helping with Florence? Uh, we do, although pr principally that is now uh, a recovery effort, as, and so we're, we're less uh, involved in that. Uh, for example, our Army Corps of Engineers is still involved uh, because of the rivers, frankly, have not completely subsided. So they continue to be. And in fact, it brings up a good point because our Army Corps of Engineers is looking at this storm and seeing how is this storm going to impact uh, those very same river basins that a month ago and a few weeks ago we were very concerned about. They're still a concern for us. Barbara Starr. Barbara Starr from CNN. Um, as you have planned against this storm and you've looked at the storm, you called it unprecedented and dangerous. Can you give us any of your analysis 
on just, you know, how serious this storm is, how dangerous it is? Yeah, thank you, Barbara, for that question. I, I, I'll bring a couple of things up. The first, I think, is going to be um, the way the storm developed was much different than we maybe have seen in the past, in the sense it really started as a tropical storm, and then it went to Category 1, then it was Category 2, and then Category 3, and then before you know it was Category 4. In fact, it's at the high end of Category 4. Um, and so I just think from the time factor, as it was coming in at the time about 12 knots, it's up to about 15 knots now of coming inland, I think the time compression uh, is a factor there. And what, where that becomes a factor is with the evacuation of some of the local populations. As one of my key concerns right now going into this is we haven't seen the, as robust of a evacuation response from the c civilian population that we have seen in, in other storms. And I think it's because of the way it kind of played out. And it, uh, many are very well prepared to, 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 to go through a Cat 1 or a Cat 2 storm, but it just very quickly uh, gained in intensity. Uh, and we're not seeing the numbers in the shelters and we're not seeing the numbers necessarily uh, going away. So my, my concern right now is there's many people in harm's way. And so that's why we want to have, especially the search and rescue capability there. And then of course the surge, besides the high winds, of course the wind speeds everyone's familiar with, but there's this surge that's going to be uh, a big factor and, and it's widespread. It's all the way, um, you know, obviously uh, right in the, in the area of uh, Tyndall Air Force Base and going to the Big Bend area there, but it's all the way really from Pensacola all the way down uh, through uh, Tampa where there'll be some impact from the surge. And so that combination of the wind, the surge, the lack of evacuations has us concerned and uh, we're then that's why we're so uh, robustly prepared to respond and, and that gets to my follow-up which is you talked about search and rescue as you have planned against the storm and you don't see the massive civilian evacuation that you would have wanted to see what are you planning what are you anticipating in terms of the overall full need for search and rescue do you have a sense of how many people, whether it's you or local authorities or whoever, how many people? Right, and, and I, I will say that, for example, the, 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 the state of Florida is very well prepared. Uh, they, they have been through this many times. They have incredible capability and capacity. Um, and, and frankly, normally we would be uh, less concerned uh, because they have such robust capability. Uh, and we see it from the federal side in coordination with FEMA, we're in direct support uh, of, the, of the governors um, and, and trying to anticipate their needs. Uh, you can see from what you uh, the reports have been out the governor uh, is very concerned about the lack of uh, evacuations um, they have that robust capability and capacity uh, they very well may be able to handle it uh, within their own capability capacity but that that because of that that's why we are postured so strongly and have such a robust team around the perimeter do you have an estimate though may, perhaps of uh, from the mil federal military side what, given the capacity you have put there and that you have on standby, what could you accomplish in terms of how many people you could get out of harm's way? Yeah, I, I don't have an estimate put that way. What, what we would look at it from more is, is our ability as we look at both the local response capability and as the storm comes through, we're going to see that uh, unlike Florence where it kind of stayed right there, we can see it's already moving through. And so the, the, the actual uh, recovery effort, I think, will be significantly different, I think. And that's why we're postured not only with the, uh, the search and rescue from the air and the helicopters, but also with the ground vehicles that will be able to come in, because you can see it's already moving uh, straight forward. So I don't have a number for you, per se, but from a capacity standpoint, uh, we are bringing in similar capability and capacity that we did for Florence, but slightly uh, change in, in the, uh, where our focus is because of the fast-moving nature of the storm, and we think we'll be able to get to it by land as well. Courtney? Then Jeff. Courtney KP with NBC News. Uh, forgive me if I just if I miss this, but when you were running through all the the assets you have, you talked about I think it was PJ teams to the west and some swift water res rescue boats. Where are the the where are they stationed? Uh, Gulfport, Mississippi is where we're, we're putting, uh, and then we also have Patrick Air Force Base was from the east side. Okay. Um, so there's two PJ teams at Patrick, and then there's more at Gulfport. Right, and, and there's a, actually there's even more throughout with both the, from the Coast Guard standpoint, uh, from the I'll use an example of our the great system that we have within the National Guard. Uh, as they feel uh, that they need additional capability, they're able to put out to other states uh, and find additional capability. So there's, for example, 15 additional helicopters coming in from other states uh, to support Florida that will also be down in the Gulfport uh, area. 15 additional uh, National Guard helicopters. That's correct. Okay, great. And then, um, uh, actually, I think that was, oh, oh, I want to thank, um, 
Hunter and Fort Stewart, they're going to have rotary and high water. I guess what I'm trying to figure out, and I know I asked you this after the, with the Florence briefing, but, you know, one thing we're always trying to figure out is where are the first things going to be coming in from? Do you have any sense, like, where are the first search and rescue assets going to be? Right. Yeah, I, I know that's hard to answer, but. Yeah, it's a great question, but that, that's frankly part of the reason why we do the surrounding parts, because you don't really know how it's going to play out. And, and in this case, we think, based on just because of the storms coming, as it comes up, they'll obviously we'll be able to come in from behind, and that's why the Patrick uh, force that's there will have the ability to come in ultimately from the south. That's why we have the refueling capability as well, so we can traverse in from the uh, from the Gulf itself, as an example. But clearly, as we see the track that's a little bit better defined in this case than it was in Florence, uh, we see that we'll probably be able to come in from from the south and then ultimately from the from the west and the east uh, additionally. And no, no assets have been requested yet, right? Everything is still being positioned, but not uh, from the federal from the federal standpoint and with respect to FEMA, our search and rescue capability uh, that. We have in place now has not been uh, activated to be put in use yet. That's great. Jeff, but and then I, I, let me just add one thing to that. But that said, I, I want to be very clear: uh, all of the states, and particularly Florida, they have incredibly robust capability from both a vertical lift or a, a helicopter search and rescue, high water vehicles, uh, and the National Guard. I'll just give you an example um, within. Within Florida, uh, they've been authorized to, uh, of 3,500 of their guardsmen uh, are authorized to be activated by the governor. They have about 2,300 of them that were in position as the storm made landfall. So they have a very robust National Guard presence that's literally, as we speak right now, actively uh, engaged. Thank you. Jeff and then Louis. Thank you. General Jeff yep. Shogel with Task and Purpose. Do you have a total number of how many Title X personnel, aircraft, and vehicles have been prepositioned? I do. As we sit right now, and this number will change dramatically over time depending on the demand signals and, and what we see. Right now there's 2,216 active duty personnel uh, that have been prepositioned. Um, there's 32 active duty uh, helicopters. Um, there's 240 active duty uh, high water vehicles uh, and 32 swift water boats. Uh, from the Title 10 or active duty side. But that number will change literally hourly uh, as the demand signals uh, come in. But that's as we sit right now, that's what we have. And forgive a rookie question, but why does there need to be a federal response if you mentioned Florida has a robust capability and a lot of National Guardsmen? Why, why is there a role for the federal government here at all? Right. Well, thanks for asking that question, Jeff. It's really part of our national response framework. And, and by design, it starts at the local level, and the local level responds. Uh, and then uh, at, based on the magnitude of the storms, it sometimes exceeds their capability and capacity. And therefore, we have the federal system that is then in place to be able to augment and, and help uh, the states uh, work their way through the challenges that they're faced with. Uh, but the, the, clearly, the intent is that the states, in this case, Florida, Georgia, for example, are going to handle uh, the initial response, and then we're going to augment in, in coordination with FEMA uh, their capabilities. Thank you. Louis, then Sylvie. Uh, Louis Martinez, ABC, sure. sir. Um, has the uh, tag in Florida been made a dual hatted um, active duty uh, commander repent so far? Yes, thanks for asking that. In fact, I just got off the phone with General Rebus um, maybe 30 minutes ago, and he has been activated as a dual status commander uh, within Florida. That gives us a tremendous opportunity as we bring our Title 10 forces in, we put them under General Rebus, and he can actually uh, also command the Guard forces. And that just that promotes a synergy of, of effort that we can be in line with exactly with what the governor needs us and wants us focused on. Uh, and so that has been uh, actually accomplished. The Secretary of Defense signed that yesterday, activated him today, and that's in place. Um, just is there, have there been lessons learned from Florence just a, a month ago? Because from our people on the ground, when they were there, in the immediate aftermath of that impact there, um, I think there was a misperception from the local population uh, that, that the U.S. military would flood the zone, so to speak, very quickly. Um, and yet that wasn't the case because the, the state had its own plan for how to deal with it. But how, how do you uh, overcome this uh, perception that the U.S. military should move in quickly? Yeah, well, I think uh, Florence is a good example. We, we did, in fact, uh, move in quickly. Uh, we had a fairly robust response, but in this case, again, uh, both North Carolina and South Carolina did tremendous job, both with their local forces and with the National Guard force uh, under the authorities uh, of the governor. And as designed, they are the first responders. They are the ones who went and do the initial part, and then we are able to uh, provide support. I'll give you just a couple examples in this. So uh, the Title 10 forces is 386 saves uh, throughout Florence, and that, while might not be uh, in, in the broader sense, um, 
uh, important uh, from the overall response. Uh, this is critical to the members that were actually saved. I'll also highlight the work that the local installations were able to do to work with the local community uh, to be able to do that Im immediate response uh, and help the first responders when they most needed that, uh, that, that help. And I will say, having personally gone down there and seen the devastation and seen the response of both the Title 10 as well as the Guard Forces, I think it actually worked uh, as it's designed to do uh, and quite effectively. Sylvie, then Lucas. Hello, sir. I'm Sylvie Lantom from AFP. Um, I know you cannot give uh, a lot of details about um, um, the um, uh, operations on the bases, um, but can you tell us uh, how many planes, for example, you had to uh, displace, or tell us if it's if it was uh, um, um, something not habitual, not usual for you? Uh, well, sp again, specifically to the, the insta individual installations and their response to it, that is under the individual authorities of the installation commander and then through the services. Uh, what we are tied to is both what, what capability do we need to be able to have available for the states and as far as the national response, and then what is the capability that we need to have for our ongoing operations and how do we transition that to a different location if we need to for the installation. So specific to how many airplanes have, have left and whatnot, I, I don't have an answer for you on that. Lucas? Fox News. On September 11th, the Russians flew a pair of nuclear-capable bombers off the coast of Alaska. Have they flown any flights like that since then? Yeah, well, uh, well thanks for highlighting uh, the fact that uh, really us at NORTHCOM and NORAD, besides uh, having robust responses to, to the hurricane, uh, we're very focused on the home and defense mission and, and our ability to uh, deter, and, and, and uh, with uh, especially as we've gone to this uh, security environment that we're in today in, the, in a much different environment than we were in just a few years ago. Uh, and so I think, uh, as, as you saw, we had a robust response to that particular event. I will say we remain vigilant uh, and we are able to respond to all of the events that have uh, that happened in and around that timeline. Have there been any events since the September 11th flight? Well, I, I wouldn't talk to the specifics of uh, the different events we have, but I just say that it's been relatively consistent in the uh, response that we've been seeing from the Russians and, uh, and an increase in the activity that we've seen over time. You said that it's been an increase over the past few years. Can you just talk generally about that? Yeah, I think part of it was actually based on not only uh, um, the geopolitical situation that we find ourselves in, but also the, their capability, and, and they had uh, been working on improving their capability, and as they did so, I think they had less capability capacity to actually um, to, to fly some of the, uh, the routine uh, sorties that they had done in the past. And so I think that was part of why it kind of dipped down and then it returned back up to uh, kind of historical uh, levels. But clearly we see this as part of the strategic environment that we're in with Russia. Okay. Back here. Sound of the Air Force Magazine. Uh, last month you said that you had an E-8 uh, J-STARS flying airborne C-2. Do you have that again for this? And if, if not, why? Yeah, great question, and, uh, and we do not actually have it flying here today. What we do have, those have E-2s, uh, similar capability, or, uh, or, or it can give us uh, some capability from, from the Navy for the command and control aspect uh, that is postured uh, to be used. Uh, what we found in Florence was because it stayed uh, and, and moved very slowly, uh, that we needed to bring in a capability capacity that could see through the clouds, uh, that we could work for the command and control for the search and rescue. You can already see from Michael, it is moving through. Uh, through so quickly that we won't, well, we have it on standby in case we need it. We don't actually think we're going to have to fly that uh, for those same reasons. And we think it, it's actually going to clear out and we'll be able to use more traditional assets to uh, maintain our command and control as well as to get situational awareness of the infrastructure and the things that have happened uh, on the, uh, due to the winds. And the shift away from, uh, the transition away from Tyndall you had mentioned, was that just the 601st? Did that include the Rescue Coordination Center as well? Uh, we, we actually moved uh, much of that to uh, Meridian. Uh, and the, on the non-homeland defense aspect of this, I can talk to it. And some of, for example, our search and rescue uh, center right now is operating out of Meridian. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got time for one more question. Uh, Louis Martinez. I'll defer to Amanda, actually. Okay. So, thanks. Um, I know you're still, Amanda Macias from CNBC, I know you're still in the planning stages, but in the wake of Florence, I'm just wondering about the funding for all of these movements, and you just got hit with two hurricanes at once, so. Right. So uh, specifically, the way the, the funding works is some of it comes under our own service authorities. Some will be refunded uh, via FEMA. Um, and so, for example, some of the activities that you see us doing, like evacuating out, that's just done through the normal service uh, routine. And where uh, we are actually refunded by FEMA is if we actually are given a mission assignment and a task, 
uh, and then we're able to uh, up, uh, get funding back from uh, FEMA in that regard. So, so uh, I think it's worked as advertised, and I think uh, it's a little bit of both as we turned out for forms, where some of it is being done under <coughs> Department of Defense authorities and uh, and money, uh, and some of it was done under will be done under FEMA as we work for our our. Um, uh, through the process of getting uh, FEMA reimbursement. Um, in this case, it'll play exactly the same. Much of what we're doing, we evacuated some of the force. That'll be done under the Department of Defense, whereas if we pick up particular mission assignments, then we'll put in for reimbursement from FEMA for that specific activities. So you're tracking that the missions and the dollars are going to line up for this? We have. And in fact, I, I have some of the some, some details, but uh, the reality of it is uh, all, all of the requests that we were given for mission assignments, uh, we, we, uh, there's a dollar amount put to that, and all that is on track uh, with FEMA for uh, appropriate reimbursement. Thank you, sir. And do you have any final comments? I do. Let me let me first thank you all for uh, um, allowing us to uh, tell a little bit of what the Department of Defense is doing, but also, as importantly, I think just getting the word out to, to the uh, local uh, populations and civilians about the severity of this storm and the concerns that we have relative to the, uh, the high winds, the surge, uh, and as quickly as it, it came upon us uh, and being able to respond. And I've certainly given you a, a quick and brief look at the robust capabilities and capacity that Department of Defense brings to support and respond immediately. Uh, but we're also poised with our second echelon forces to prepare to deploy orders or basically on call. And these forces represent the full spectrum of military capabilities such as medical, logistical mobility, aviation and communications. And so over the upcoming days, I would, we will stay in close communication with you to describe the activities that we see as we watch what the storm does and we watch the reactions and the capability and capacity of the local and state authorities and how uh, we will need to uh, respond as well. Uh, and we feel that Department of Defense is a vital partner for both state and local response efforts through FEMA. Uh, and our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and their families are certainly part of the local communities. And for us, this is a no-fail mission. It's personal to us, and we remain capable, ready, and postured to support. Thank you all very much. Thank you.